Let's talk about something that quite a few people have asked me about, which is what are my favorite albums of all time or which albums would I say are like front to back masterpieces that are 10 out of 10s with no skips, meaning that there's a lot of albums by bands that I really love and I may even love the album, but there's, you know, always at least two or three songs that I'm going to skip. Or for me, if an album even just has two or three good songs on it and I skip you know, three quarters of them, I'm still happy. It's hard for me to listen to a whole album front to back. To me, like, I'm very picky about that. So there are not very many albums that I would consider 10 out of 10s with no skips, but I thought about it and there actually are a handful. So let's talk about what those are. This is just my personal opinion. I'm not saying that, you know, this is like, the definitive end all be all list of greatest albums of all time or anything like that. All I'm saying is for those who have asked, these are the albums that I would consider 10 out of 10s with no skips. But first I wanna thank Factor for sponsoring this video. Factor delivers fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. It's clean eating made easy, which is perfect for me because my diet is very important to me, but also honestly, I kinda hate to cook. Factor helps you with more wholesome eating habits, but makes it all simple. And their meal plans have a ton of variety with a rotating weekly menu of over 25 different meal options. You can choose your own favorite meals, or you can just let Factor choose it for you and craft your order based on your taste preferences and meal history. I work a lot, and like I said, I just do not enjoy cooking, but I still wanna eat fresh, good food. So I really like that when it's time for lunch, I can just run downstairs, pick something out of the fridge, heat it up, and I'm good to go. It's really convenient, but I'm still hitting my macro goals, and I'm not eating gross processed food. I got the calorie smart option this month, which is healthy, but also tastes great. So if you wanna check it out, head to go.factor75.com slash fin130 and use the code FIN130 to get $130 off across six boxes. Once again, that is go.factor75.com slash FIN130 and use code FIN130 to get $130 off across six boxes or hit the link in the description of this video. The first one would be Enema of the State by Blink-182. Of course, everybody knows this album. Timeless classic. I've listened to this album so many times. I remember when I moved from uh, Cleveland to Seattle, that's like a two or three day drive. I listened to this and Live Fast Diarrhea by the Vandals the entire trip. We had like two tapes in the car and we listened to them just like front to back, front to back, front to back. I have listened to this album like pretty continuously since then. And I gotta say it holds up. Not a bad song in the album, just flawless songwriting, flawless production, flawless performances. Just every little detail is perfect. And you know, to this day, I would say that this is still the template for like what people would think of as pop punk. You know, you could debate, maybe it's the self-titled album or whatever, or take off your pants and jacket, whatever. But I think that Blink-182 in general is the template for modern pop punk. And I think this album, in my opinion, is their strongest one that more than anything else stands the test of time. Cause there's some sort of weird experimental songs on their other albums um, that to me are a little, you know, I wouldn't choose to listen to those. Like what's the one on a self-titled album that like really weird sort of noisy progressive kind of one. I forget the name of it, but like, you know, I would skip that song. I don't know, some stuff on their other albums that's not bad, but I would choose to skip. Whereas with this album, I know every song, I know every note on this album, like by heart, every single one. Um, and really, you know, the addition of Travis to me is what really made the band. Like they were good before with Scott, um, but I wouldn't say that they were necessarily like elite, like God tier band. When they got Travis in the band, that's what changed everything for them. That's what made them into the like just absolute god tier legends that they are now. Uh, I was just wondering here, this scene uh, with them dancing in their underwear, uh, these like cheap tidy whiteies, I feel like with the uh, those bright lights that you get like on a video set, I feel like there's a good chance you could see his, but yeah, that is the first album. Again, this is in no particular order. The videos too, I mean, all of it. The videos are great. Their fits. I mean, this is the beginning of the ankle length chance with a Hurley shirt era. 
just everything about this 10 out of 10 classic. The next album that I would say is a 10 out of 10 classic with no skips. City of Evil by Avenged Sevenfold. Featuring, of course, Bat Country. Their breakthrough song is from 2004, I think, right? Picking up Johnny on the way to Vegas. I love the production on this, love the drums. Great snare sound. It took me a while to really appreciate this band. I, I thought they were pretty cool when they came out, but I didn't really appreciate them until years and years later. My wife is like an Avenged Sevenfold, like mega super fan, and she really helped me appreciate the details. And I've listened to their entire discography front to back many times because of her. And uh, the more I listen to this album, the more I appreciate it for what it is, which is it's actually a progressive metal masterpiece. You know, people wrote them off as emo F words back then and called them like a scene band and blah, 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 blah. There's nothing emo about this band. There's nothing seen about this band. They're a progressive metal band. They certainly have some sort of punk touches. You know, it's like sort of the combination of like early Orange County hardcore like DI or The Adolescents with Guns N' Roses and Pantera and like Frank Zappa would be, I would say, the way to describe Avenged Sevenfold. I feel like a lot of people maybe haven't really listened to them. Like if you think they're emo, yeah, I mean, first of all, the guys are all like, well, Johnny's short, but the other guys in the band are all like, you know, 6'2 and like jacked. They look like football players. There's nothing emo about them. Aside from that, I mean, the shortest song on this album was like five minutes long. Beast and the Harlot, I believe it is, was their like second big hit single. The solo was like a fucking minute long. Like what other band was on MTV playing like this shit? Ripping solos and leads. Such cool drumming too. It's been like a minute. There's no vocals. Like there's a huge chunk of this song with no vocals and it was on TRL. That's right. Like you said before, one of the last guitar bands to go mainstream. I don't think, unless there's a band I'm forgetting, I actually don't think that there's been a band after them that got big that played, you know, really like blazing solos or guitar or drums like they did. So, you know, if you're into that sort of thing, give them some credit for that. Just really interesting. And they were like 24 when they did this. Like, it's crazy. I think this is a masterpiece, like way, way, way better than what anybody thought they were at the time. I would say not a bad song in this album. Their other albums are also great, uh, but some of those have some sort of weird songs that I might skip. Uh, whereas this album, Front to Back Classics, No Skips, it's a 10 in my book. The next album that I would give a 10 out of 10 is Appetite for Destruction by Guns N' Roses. If you write Guns N' Roses off as boomer music, you are fucking up. You are doing yourself a huge disservice if you are not taking Guns N' Roses seriously. Savage fucking album. Savage. Also, if you're into guitar, like nerdy guitar stuff, listen on headphones. These are some of the most interesting, intricate guitar arrangements ever. Like Izzy and Slash are playing two different parts almost the whole time. And they're both like very strange, like scratchy kind of rhythms. It's like really interesting stuff. Exactly. They're basically a blues band mixed with glam punk. Exactly. God, what a great album. Again, every song in the album is great. You know, maybe some are like the worst song in this album is still an eight. You know, songs like this and Paradise City or Mr. Brownstone, those are like 10 out of 10 all time classics. People will still be listening to those songs in 30 or 40 years. So those are just like all time classics. But even the songs like on the album that are maybe not the best, like uh, It's So Easy, is still like an eight out of 10 song. Everything on this holds up. I've been listening to this album since it came out, since I, I was a little kid. Um, and, uh, not a bad song in the album, like, and just, I mean, everything about it again, like even their aesthetic, you know, like Axel's like little orange, uh, whatever you like pop filter on the microphone, like still iconic, such a little thing like that. Obviously, you know, slashes 
top hat and hair and his Les Pauls, like just everything about this just defines that Sunset Strip Hollywood kind of era. Lars from Metallica has said many times this album was what made them see how music was changing and they needed to slow things down for the Black Album. And that's a good, that's a good observation because the songwriting on this album is just untouchable. Like absolutely untouchable to this day it's been what 35 years since this album came out how many bands have been inspired by guns and roses in terms of this like sort of you know sleazy sort of sunset strip hair metal kind of thing has anybody done it better than them on this album has anybody even come close to doing it as well as they did on this album i would say no basically this is one of those albums where when this came out Nobody should have ever attempted to try to play this style again because it's just that good. That's like, well, all right. They clearly like are the best to ever do this. So like, we're just going to stop. That's what I think. Like, cause you're never going to beat them at this. They did copy MGK. It's true. Once MGK came out, Guns N' Roses just hopped on the bandwagon. The next one, which I would call a 10 out of 10. I'm sure a lot of people would disagree with me on this, but again, this is just my personal opinion. A 10 out of 10 with no skips is Underdog Alma Mater by Forever the Sickest Kids from 2007. And again, you'll notice a common thread with a lot of this is like bands with really strong sort of core songwriting, but also who have these really elaborate, interesting, nuanced arrangements, which is exactly what they did. This has like three guitars, three vocalists, synths, electronic drums, acoustic drums, and just these like really elaborate Baroque structures to the songs. Like it's actually super progressive. If you haven't listened to it on headphones, you really should. This album was a masterpiece of neon pop punk. They have like, uh, I think three other albums and they're all pretty good. Well, they're all good. Like they never put out anything bad, but they were never able to equal this either. And they were super young when they did this too. Like I want to say uh, the drummer was like 20 when they did this. They were like super fucking young. You can listen to their demos from when they were like in high school when they started doing this stuff. And you can tell these guys are just fucking freaks. I don't know what the fucking secret sauce is, but... Whatever they did on this album is just kind of mind-blowing to think of people this young doing something this good and this complex. Saw them at Warp Tour the year before this came out, 10 people the year after, packed. Yeah, Hey Britney, that's a great song. Listen to this part here. Listen to all the stuff that's going on here with the acoustic drums, electric drums, the synths, all the layers of like vocal harmonies and shit. Listen to all the stuff that's going on here. Some more guitars and another layer of synths coming in here on the right. It's a really good drum sound too. Okay, that's right. They did do that Nerf commercial. I do remember that. Next up on this list is Vulgar Display of Power by Pantera from 1992. I've talked about this before, so you know my thoughts. All the Phil era stuff with Pantera is pretty great. Um, I think Cowboys from Hell is a fantastic album. Uh, Far Beyond Driven is also a fantastic album. But on both of those albums, there still are a few songs that I would say like are skips for me. They're not bad, um, but a few songs just kind of go on too long or like just sort of like not that interesting to me. Uh, but this album, Vulgar Display of Power, every single song is a banger. The worst song for me would be This Love, which is still a really good song. It's one of these albums also where every song, it has a cohesive element or like it has a cohesive sound. All the songs feel like they belong together, but every song stands on its own and feels different. You know, you've got fast songs like fucking Hostile. You've got the groove songs like this. You've got Walk, which is obviously like, you know, one of the most iconic classic metal songs of all time that pretty much started off the whole like groove metal thing after walk came out everyone was like i'm doing that everyone had to have their shaved head goatee tough guy you know phil impersonator in the band it pretty much made like thrash metal extinct like when pantera came out like it just made thrash sound goofy you know the other thing i mean i've talked about this before but you got to talk about vinnie's drumming very underrated so much groove he played really weird stuff not like super technical or flashy but like really weird with great great grooves if you listen to Vinny's drumming it actually kind of sounds like ZZ Top which is interesting I mean they're from Texas so that makes sense um 
Dimebag, obviously a legend. Just everything about this album to me still holds up. I still listen to it. I can put it on front to back and listen to the whole thing without ever getting bored. Even I've heard this album thousands of times since it came out over the past 30 years. And uh, I can still listen to it and I never get bored. The next album that I would say is a 10 out of 10 classic for me is I Disagree by Poppy from 2019. Really interesting album. I've never heard anything like this before or since. Very strange, just kind of all over the place, but still really catchy and poppy. This would be one of the more like sedate songs. This is like one of the weirder songs. Bite your own teeth. Yeah, artsy fartsy but catchy. That's a perfect way to put it. This album's really just all over the place. Um, it's very interesting. She manages to do like three or four different genres or sounds in one song and yet the album as a whole really comes together and feels cohesive the way that other people feel about mr bungle or faith no more is how i feel about this album as far as it just being like all over the place like artsy experimental shit but unlike faith no more i think it's actually catchy and still has like still high energy so this is an album that i again i've listened to pretty sure this was my most listened to album of 2020 i listened to this so much like I still listen to it all the time like if I want to write and like just really like focus and concentrate I'll put this album and repeat and listen to it like three or four times it is a 10 out of 10 for me absolutely no skips on that album still a classic her new stuff she does like more a like, sort of straightforward grunge kind of stuff now which isn't bad but uh to me it's a lot less interesting this album so this album was like a one-off nobody has ever done anything like it before or since in my opinion next 10 out of 10 with no skips is Out of Step by Minor Threat, their one and only album. You know, a lot of people seem to prefer their 7 Inches because the album was a little bit more, I guess progressive is the right word for it. Not quite as like straightforward punk. I've been listening to this also for 30 years. I can still listen to it front to back, no problem. This is actually my favorite Minor Threat song. Which is a pretty, I don't think that many people like this song. Like, this is pretty cool. That's a really cool riff, right? Really great underrated drumming, too. People have written tons and tons and tons and tons of things about Minor Threat. I don't think I really have much to add to what has already been said about them, other than to say... If you only know them for songs like Straight Edge and Screaming at a Wall, which are great songs, I would say maybe just check out Out of Step, which to me is a little bit more interesting just because it adds a little bit more to the formula. All right. The next album that I would say is on that list, picking up on the punk rock kind of direction, is Energy by Operation Ivy. Uh, if you get the CD, it has almost everything that they recorded, and it's all great. I know things are getting tougher when you can't get the thumb off the bottom of the barrel. Obviously, the production Look is like putrid. Putrid production. You guys all know about Operation Ivy, I hope. For one, the pioneers of ska core, along with Mighty Mighty Boss Tones, I know. I've uh, talked a lot of shit about ska, and I will continue to talk a lot of shit about ska because... Almost all of it is terrible, but Operation Ivy is great. As most of you probably know, this is like basically the precursor to Rancid. Tim and Matt uh, from Rancid were previously in Operation Ivy. I want to say that they were like 17 or 18 when they did this. This, this songwriting is just fucking incredible. Like, imagine writing songs this good when you're like 17. And I actually think that that like terrible, super raw production actually adds to it. You know, energy is the perfect name for this because it does have so much energy. It's just so catchy. You feel like you're at a show when you listen to this. And I feel like so many bands say like, oh, we just wanted to capture the feeling of our live show. And they almost never do, right? Like it's it just, that's typically 
recordings just don't sound that high energy, but they did it with this one. Every song on this album is fucking great. Uh, I hope that they still feel that way, even though they wrote these a long time ago. I still maintain that Tim Armstrong is the best punk songwriter of all time. And I think the fact that he wrote most of this stuff when he was in fucking high school, to me, proves it. So if for some reason you have never listened to the Operation Ivy discography, you should absolutely go do that right now because this is a 10 out of 10. There are absolutely no skips on this one. Now, the last one on our list on the heavier side of things is the cleansing by Suicide Silence. I actually didn't realize that I was wearing this shirt today, but here we go. In my opinion, if I had to pick the greatest deathcore album or release of all time, it is this and it's not even close. Like nothing else in the entire genre even comes close to this, period. So heavy and raw, so brutal, but so catchy at the same time. I still listen to this all the time. There's so many things about this album that I feel like people don't really... I mean, people do appreciate it, but people that people should appreciate. Number one, obviously, like Mitch's vocals, still the best in the entire genre. There's the Mitch Lucker Memorial Show where they had people from like other bands cover Suicide Silence. And as, uh, as great as they are, nobody else did it nearly as well as he did, including, you know, like Austin Carlisle, Danny Warsnop, you know, Phil from Whitechapel, although Phil did really fucking well. The songwriting on this is great, so catchy but still so brutal. So many like dynamics. That's where a lot of these bands lost it is they were just brutal, but they weren't catchy. That's what Suicide Silence did. Uh, and also they recorded this live in the same room together, which is almost unheard of. Like nobody does that because most bands can't do it. And I think that's a big part of what makes this feel so just like aggressive and raw and nasty is, uh, you know, because they recorded it live like that. You know, you just can't, uh, you can't get that feel any other way. Uh, also, shout out to Alex's drumming. I feel like that, like, um, that, like, punk kind of groove that he has. Huge part of this sound. There's lots of other drummers that maybe play stuff that's flashier or more technical than Alex. But when it comes to just, like, groove, I don't think there's anybody else in the genre better than him. And that fucking snare sound... You guys know how I feel about the Suicide Silence Snare, the Alex Lopez Suicide Silence Snare, the greatest of all time. The best snare of all time. This album's catchy as hell. So there it is. Those are my 10 out of 10, no skips. Again, not saying this is like the definitive list of great albums of all time or anything like that. I'm just saying for me personally, as someone who does not have very many releases that they listen to from front to back that I would call like 10 out of 10s with no skips, that is my list. I would love to know what you guys think. And uh, if I think of any more, then maybe we'll do a part two.